Good morning, Kat. Um, when you're bad, you're really good. <laughs> yeah, we're so glad to have Kat, Kat back. Before I get started with the meditation this morning, I want to just acknowledge uh, the, the casting crew that supports me. Have Margaret been every, Margaret, here she has been every, she's pretty much in charge of the programming. Uh, of course, uh, uh, our friend, we have talked to Roy, is there. Lou Raskin is back here. Lou, Lou Raskin runs the website. Lou. Okay, there, there he's back there. Sergio, of course, runs that. Uh, sound. Uh, and Karen is in charge of the, of the, uh, the food and stuff like that. Uh, who am I missing out? Hillary. 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 Oh, Hillary, of course. Where are you go? Hillary is the one who's in charge of, of the finance. But Hillary, she's sitting there in the back. She's anchored that position for the last five years. So. And so is not here. So I that who is in competition with Cat for the <laughs> We we are so grateful for our moderators that that uh, run the show here. So for the meditation centric moment this morning, um, I'm gonna give you the beginning of a Mary Oliver poem. And if you get this poem, you can leave. <laughs> if you can understand is that, that what she's saying, you can leave, because that's all I'm going to say today. So here, here's a poem. So what, I'm just going to give the poem three lines, and then I'm going to have you just drop inside and answer the question that the poem asks. Mary Oliver says, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of the body love what it loves. You only, you do not have to be good, you only have to let the soft animal of the body love what it loves. So as you go into the center moment this morning, I want you to go into your body and ask your body, what does it love? Let's go inside for a minute and ask the question, what does the soft animal of your body love? Thank you for attending to yourself, the soft animal of your body. I love that, I love that metaphor. It, um, and you'll see if we go through why I love it so much. <clears throat> Today, I hope I can help you see with the unworn side of your eyes. They have such a tendency to see life as one perspective. Uh, today, I'd like to invite you to see with the unworn side of your eyes. It's extraordinary, as Joseph Conrad says in his book. Um, it's a, it's ordinary, extraordinary how we go through life with eyes half shut, with dull ears, and dormant thoughts. So today my chief desire is to, to stir thought, to trouble sleep, and hopefully provide a wider perspective. I will introduce a new paradigm, so we'll just try it on. What I'm going to say is it have to be true. It's an idea that I want you just to just interact with. Um, so, to let you know about this talk, dreams have been a tremendous guide of my life. I was privileged to be one of those people who had a relationship with the dream, the dream would give me information as I went on my journey. And what I have learned is that dreams allow us to behold something that's there, not create it. So for me, when I wake up from a dream, I behold, 
because I get to see something that's already there. I didn't create it. My task as a mind-operating individual is to try to, to bring thought and psychological growth and attendance to me so that, that, I can, that I can be what this voice calls me to be. So um, for me, it's kind of simple to the life. I just ask the dream, what does it want me to do? And it tells me. And this has governed my life from the time that I was in graduate school. So um, another thing to say is that I always have more to say than I get to say. Have you ever heard me speak before? <laughs> have, have you ever heard me say, oh, I didn't wish I could have got to that? Well, I, I have to figure out how to solve that. I'm going to give you six points so that when I get, get to the end of the talk, you'll, you'll have six points in your mind. The first one is what the quote of the, the verb I wrote, which is, a belief is not an idea the mind possesses. A belief is an idea that has possessed the mind. So I'll say it again. This is an important thing. A belief is not an idea the mind possesses. A belief is an idea that has possessed the mind. That's why, by the way, there are wars, because people think that theirs is the right, the right way. A belief has possessed them. And hopefully we can explore that. The second thing came from a dream at the end of my at the end of my initiation. I asked I asked the great wisdom, what is has all this ten years of torture been been for? And uh, the dream was, I was grabbed by a, a fist, drawn down to a manhole cover, so my legs were on top of the ground and my head was underneath us. And this voice and this ferocity said, no, I'm not a ghost. I have brought you here to teach you that man is a portal. So that man is the portal. So then I said, what in the world does that mean? So that's that point too. Um, and then, and then, uh, how many of you know Leonard Cohen? Any Canadians know Leonard Cohen? He said this in an article in, in the Symbolic Sun years ago. He said, um, uh, these problems exist before we do. And we, and we gather ourselves around them. That is what a human being is. A gathering around the perplexity. Well, the perspective that I'm going here, but maybe we're here to solve something that's not solved, not yet solved. So that's the third point. Um, and then the third, the third point is to, is to say that the dream gave me this language as well. Belief belies. There is a lie inside every belief. B-E-L-I-E-F. There's a lie inside every belief. And so, um, when we we know that, we also know that the belief is the, one of the biggest problems in our culture. And we are at a point in our culture where we're, we're polarized around around beliefs. Am I right? I'm sure which side you're on, the, you're on. We're polarized by these beliefs, and we uh, you know we have to figure out what to do differently. Um, and then I want to talk about how belief works, and then I'm going to talk to spend some time on how should we then live. And so if I, if I got the preacher going in, you know, I start to tell you how you're supposed to live your life, you know, cut it in half and just use it as a suggestion. So I don't know how you're supposed to live your life. <laughs> okay, so how this started for me, this talk, by the way, started in 19... 74. I was at a workshop in, I was in, I was in graduate school, I, was at, I grew up in Christian fundamentalism, and I was at a workshop in, in Chicago. There was 20,000 people in, in the corner place in Chicago. And I was there to listen to this guy who, I really, I really liked him. I was, I was born a fundamentalist, my dad was a fundamentalist minister, and I believed the deep Christian doctrine of finding sinker all the way across the board. So I went there to this, to this guy, because he was one of these guys who take the Bible and say, let me see what you're saying, and I tell a nasty joke, so, so I'll tell you to confess your sin, and everything will be fine, you won't have any more anxiety. And he was one of these guys who would sit on the stage and tell people how they were to live their life, right? So I went there, 20,000 people, and he said, there was a principle he had, he said, that God always allows things for a purpose. He said, let me give you an example. He said, 
A girl came to me in her, in her early 20s. She wanted to get married. But she couldn't quite commit herself to her boyfriend. And so she said, ah, have you committed sexual sin? <laughs> and uh, those of you who grew up in fundamentalist church, you know the sexual sin is the worst of them all. You know. <laughs> have you committed sexual sin? She says, no. Like, I get close to sex. To something. I get close and I just freeze up. And he comes to the eyes. Oh, that's what I mean. God had you raped in order for you to be uh, as an inoculation against sexual sin. He said he had to he was molested, molested so that so the, the wound would knock at her so she would never commit sexual sin. And I was in the back and saying, Wayne, what was and everyone said, so, so, did you hear what he said? He said that God had her raped in order to prevent her from sexual from committing sexual sin. And Something shattered in my in my being. So I went back. I went back to the went back to seminary. I was in fundamental seminary, and I had to figure out how how do I reconcile with this? That everything he believed, the, the, the scripture is the word of God. God knows everything. God's all powerful. So nothing can happen without his without his perspective. Yeah. And it just didn't fit anymore. So I, I got to go. So I actually wrote a thesis on this guy. And my thesis is, by the way, the most read thesis in my seminary. Because I, I said stuff that no one's been able to refute yet. So that was, that was, I thought that was kind of cool. But, um, so, I'm going. so I, I, I did my, I was doing my seminary work, and I, and I asked the question, how can he do this? How can, how can he? So I found a book called The Strange Silence of the Bible in the Church. And the author of that book said that every interpreter of Scripture lays a grid across the top of the Scripture so that only things that fit with the belief structure come through and register in the consciousness. Okay? I said, wow, that means that everybody that I've ever heard preach a, a sermon is, is caught in that same thing, that they, they believe what they believe because of what What's underneath? So I made I made a brilliant statement in, in my thesis. I said, "I finally learned that psychology, the person's psychology, precedes their, the precedes their theology. The psychology precedes theology. Then I can understand. See, well, as a kid, the kids could play things. They could smoke. They could drink. They could go to movies. They could have sex. Catholics could do all, all. All they had to do was go to the priest and say." You know, priest and say, uh, I, I've sinned. You know, tell Mary, I said, that's a pretty good deal, but why can't we? <laughs> and, I, and to my embarrassment, I realized that, that those people that are in the more fundamentalist side of, of their religious expression, and that generalized to other things later on, but, but at that, that point, what, what I understood is the people that, that were, were fundamentalists are the most psychologically scarred. So because they're psychologically scarred, they've not developed the capacity to go inside and connect up with their own, their own wisdom, they end up uh, buying into a dogma that's very, very fundamental. It's because if you don't know anything, you can't, if you can't really think and find your own center, then you want someone to tell you what you think and believe. And so I, I wrote that, I said, that our theology perceives our, our, our psychology perceives our, our theology. And that set me free to then begin a lifetime of exploration of what's underneath all my defensiveness, what's underneath all my beliefs, generalized to society, what is underneath our culture's fear right now. We have to look at what the fear is because, you know, well, I'm not going to get it by, by belief. So, okay, that's how, I got, that's how I got here. Another thing I got in the dream later, later on that I was doing this, this work with the, fem with the feminine, um, I got a series of a series of coins that were given to me that, that appeared in my first book, The Man Loves the Wine, She Serves Her Body. And there were two that relate to this topic. And one of the, the coins was, and what do we get the backstory of this is one that I was given a dream, I was given a, a grid of 16 squares, and the dream gave me three uh, coins that didn't decide to those squares. And so I kind of woke up and the, the title of the book, The Man Loves the Wine, She Serves Her Body was one of them. But I, over the next six months, I got, I got those blank calls for the next night. 
Give me this one and this one. The one that's relevant to this is it's said, the dream said, desire comes from outside the body. We think that we think that we want. Our perspective is always that we want this. It shows up in me as I want this. I want I want food, I want sex, I want relationship, I want uh, I can be funny, I want to, I want to make money. And we think that's us wanting something. And the new side of the eyes that I want to look at today is maybe something wants us to do something. Maybe there's something in the soul that it wants us to do something that's fighting its way through our, our conscious mind to, to get to it. Um, so I got, I got that one. That's what I got was all longing is a partner. So what could that mean? Well, to me, to me, it, meant, it means that that when I long for connection to the soul, to the sacred, to divinity, to wisdom, you know, when I understand that I want that, maybe it wants something for me as well. Maybe it's not just me wanting. Maybe, maybe my body recognizes what something else is calling me towards. And I have found great freedom and joy and uh, peace, I guess I would say, when I understand that we are all called to do something with our lives. Some of us don't want to do it because it's too much work. That's okay. I do. My, my last calling has been to, to wake up to what I am, and, and, and that's been important to me. Um, so, uh, Bill Stafford, poet laureate of Oregon, poet laureate of Oregon said that is that the things you hear, things you know, before you hear them, that's you. That's why you're in the world. So we go along and you read, and some, someone finally says something that, yes, 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 why didn't I say that? That's that, that the soul is, is resonating back to the mind. This is what I'm here to, to bring forth, bring forth in the world. And just to sort of show how the, uh, the, um, the, the dream the dream works is um, one one night I was I was listening to my dream it was Willie Nelson singing the song help me make it through the night and so I I said I went to the said, oh thank you for the for the encouragement that helped me make it through the night he said no I was asking you to help me make it through the night and it just blew me away that there was Something there in the psyche that, that is saying, I need you, David. I need your mind. I need your wisdom. I need your relationship. I need your love. I need your poetry. I need your art. I want to show something through you. It's not just David doing it. It's creative. It's David responding to what the other, other voice called forward. So my, my fundamental state, I would have really wanted to, to know what all this confusion was about. And uh, I was ready, ready to to bail out, I, I just screamed one night at the people, please tell me what's going on. And it simply said, you are involved in a heuristic process. Anyone know, know what that means? I didn't either. <laughs> so I didn't even know how to spell a word. So the next night the dream spelled it for me. <laughs> I'm not thinking. Of... <laughs> what a heuristic process is, it, it's a process of learning where to go by going where you go. You don't, there's not a path here. So David's going to walk down here, down like this. But when David walks here, he gets to see this. He takes another step, he gets to see this. There's no, there's no one way that David's supposed to go. But it's an interactive process that, that allows the, the, the deep psyche to bring forth its material through, the, through all my brokenness and all my, my evil jokes that I tell and stuff like that. The psyche is, is still there. It's still there, wanting me, wanting me to learn something and move something forward in the world. And so it, it, it said to me, "Do not be done." Do not "Don't be done." If you, did, if you try to finish this off now, it would not go well for you. So I, I stayed. I stayed in, in the process. Um, so belief is not truth. How many would agree with that? So, if we, if we, that. we think that we think that a belief is true, but in reality, 
It just corresponds to, to an idea we might have we might have inside. The, uh, the current political debate. I, I'm just scared with the news. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to go to find out what's going on. I can line up in my tribe and get information from my tribe, but I have no no clue if that's right or wrong information. And it goes on both sides. It goes on both sides that that uh, uh, this, this belief does not have truth. Belief is tied to our fear. All the beliefs you have, and I'll ask you to, to think about it now and then chew on it, that every belief you have is based somewhere on a fear. Maybe a fear of not having enough money, not being pretty enough, not being acceptable enough, not being smart enough. Fear of annihilation. Human beings are born into this world with this tremendous fear of anxiety. We, we, we come into the world, the first thing we do is cry for help. We're dependent on our on the world, and the world basically, in that first coming to life, it gives us a betrayal. We're no longer safe. And we all know down at the bottom that we're all, that we're all unsafe. Um, uh, fear is rooted in not belonging, not being lovable, fear of not being enough, being condemned. Um, so, to show you how beliefs, I, I, I think I have a, a wound from the church, so I keep going after the the church because I think it is such a damaging, damaging institution in our society. I'm say it up front. I, a friend of ours had, a, had cousins that lived in Alabama years ago and a hurricane came through. And uh, they, they lived in, in, in Mississippi and they, uh, uh, they prayed and we got to the free. Please set the free help make this a monster hurricane. Go away. And guess what? God answered their prayer. Storm came just like that. Except they got the next time. Slaughtered it. But their belief, their belief that God answers prayer does not fit with, with the logical things that we that we, we we know happen. And so in so many many of our beliefs is, is this uh, 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 this idea that uh, uh, that are not true. They're not true. Most of our anger, or most of our beliefs, well, are there to, to calm the story. To try to calm the story down. It's running, it's running, running. It's, it's a story. It's, so our, our beliefs are, are designed to make that make sense of that story. Um, the other thing about belief is that. Have you ever noticed how that the more we hate something, the more inclined we are to tribalize up? We join, we join a tribe that hates the same thing we do. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but my guess would be that there are people here who are experiencing more hate than their feelings now than any other time in our political history. Would that, would that be accurate? There's so much. And we get together and we and we, we talk about things. Both sides, both sides, of talk about things that are that are are, are awful, and we live troubled by it. We suffer. We suffer from the troubles that, that's there. So we we always seek allies when we hate. Um, so where? Where do beliefs come? Where do beliefs come from? Well, they come from childhood trauma. Every childhood trauma you have, the belief will come in order to make sense of the world that we grow up in. If you if you grow up in a world with a violent father, you grow up in, and everything you do, you learn not to be vulnerable to a vulnerable father and to walk away. If you if you're born into a house where a mother has to clutch you, she clings you and holds you too tight, and you have to develop a belief to get away from that. The fact of the matter is that most of us most of us are desperate to find to find where we belong in the world. We're desperate to find that. And we think that we think that the new lover, the, the new car, <laughs> the new uh not the new motorcycle. <laughs> 
the new, the new chop saw, maybe. And maybe some of us that we have done here that want to go to Mexico, my problem for leave me behind. You know, there's like this idea that, that changing locations, there's something else that I don't have will will make it will make it different. Um, so one of the things that belief does is belief cuts us off from our feelings. Maybe, maybe the, the deepest pathology that's in our culture today is the worship of the mind and thinking, which cuts people away from what's in the feeling and what's in the unconscious. Some people have said that the, 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 the worst pathology of our day is the schism between the brain and the body. That, that's where we're that's where we're hung up. We, we don't. So how, that, how does that work? Well, let's say that that um, um, uh, I should go back to my notes. Um, yeah, the spiritual, the special disease of civilized man might be described as the, a block or schism between the body and the brain. So we'll go back to the beginning. All you have to do is let, let the soft animal of your body love what it, what it loves. But for many of us to drop into our body, we don't know what to do. So much anxiety in us for not knowing what to do when we get, we get there, and we'll get to that what to do in a minute. As long as I have a belief, as long as I can, as long as I can handle my existential angst by saying I'm worried about about global warming. Anybody have had a few minutes? This is really what's really bothering me is global warming. I think about it all the time, blah, 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 blah. The, the, the idea is that, that I can't solve that problem of belief by my mind. It's like teeth trying to bite themselves to make me say something different. Oh no, it's only blah this or blah that. The answer is always that the soft animal of the body loves what it loves. Um, we have you ever noticed how people that believe strongly they're blinded by it? How, are you blinded by your beliefs? If you're not, then you have some some certain researching to do inside. You know, say every belief, every belief is is, is, is the lie, and. Um, so we we end up end up with beliefs based upon how how family is, what formative experiences we grew up in. Um, here's how belief works mostly. If, if if I'm a typical American or Canadian Canadian too, if I'm a typical Canadian and an American, and I um, and, and I have an opinion about uh, a political figure in Russia, let's say. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, I, let me just make a caveat here. We can joke about the political situation that we're in now, but what concerns me more than the right or wrongness of it is how much, how tribal our country has become. I'm going to talk a little bit about tribalism. If I, if, if we were to talk about talk about a situation that that you and I could unite and agree on, let's let's say let's talk about a political situation. Pretty easy, pretty easy to say this person did this, she did this, she did that. But the way to solve it is to come back with each other and say, this is what I'm afraid of. This is where I'm powerful. So that, the, that the, the, the tribal connection is between, between those that share a common feeling rather than a common belief. Because the belief covers up the feeling for what I don't, for what I don't know. Every, every belief I have is covering up for fear. If I want to be intimate, if I want to have intimacy with you, the best way for me to do is let you know who I really am. If I don't let you know who I really am, 
I give you a false impression of myself. So I present a picture of myself as a master builder, right? And not get my bill. Present it as a, a master builder. And someone comes and says, hey, here you're, you're, you're a good builder. Well, what happens? I feel great anxiety because now I've got to, I've got to match what I, what I said it's all about. My, my, whole, my whole belief about myself is, is false. So as I, if I present a false belief to you about me, you only get to know a false side of me. You want to get to know me, David? What are you really afraid of? What, what new idea is coming into you that, that's trying to make some sense? What's trying to articulate itself to you? What's new coming to you today? What are you curious about? Those are the questions that create intimacy. Not what do you believe, or what do you think about this person or about that person, but what's happening inside, inside of you. So, um, we, learned, we learned as Baptists is that, that the cat letters, the Catholics, they were all going to hell because they didn't believe these words. And the Jehovah's Witnesses, whatever. And, okay, okay. Um, so, if what I present to you is an illusion of who I am, then there's no chance that I will feel intimacy, and I will feel lonely and more isolated, and more, have more tendency to go and get tribal than, than to stay in, in, relationship with, in relationship with you. always it's just the winnowing down of what to say when. Okay. How should we then live? How do we know when we're caught in belief? I have way, way more than I should have thought. <laughs> how do we how do we, we unlock the door to the body? The first thing is to realize that one, there's fear. My task is not to talk myself out of the fear. It's to come to the fear and experience what fear really is like. Can I experience what's here? Most people are terrified of their fear. We don't need to be. We're terrified of fear because we're not used to saying, well, what, what happens if I actually feel fear? I remember once on my, my cabin, a uh, cabin and a skunk or a, a, a rabbit had crawled up on the deck, it was stinky and smelly and putrid, and I was agitated because I wanted to write. And then I said to myself, but I've never let myself actually experience the smell of putrid. So I said, okay, hold it down. <laughs> and that quick, the irritation was gone. We are so afraid of experiencing things in our feelings that we, that we, we uh, have to make a belief to make it go away. Um, so we, we create these tribal loyalties. Um, if you want to find out where, what's underneath your belief, if every time you say, I believe, go and ask the question, where's the lie in that belief? Every time you hear it, every time your friend says, I believe it, whenever you say, they are, or they did, or they, they will, this idea of they, the big they, you always know you're caught in the belief then. You know, I can say, they do this, but I, I, I'm going to go cat to them and say, what does cat feel about this? Not what do the gringos down here in Mexico feel about this. But it's, so I can recognize it in, in my belief. I can recognize my I'm caught in a belief when I have stridency. The more strident I am in my in my uh, in my opinion. But it is this way. I've had people down here, nice sweet people, say to me, "I want to kill that." <laughs> I, I know people, and I know, I know there are people that maybe feel that or are too ashamed to say. If something is happening, something is happening to us, and we want to get beneath that. And what is what's going on there? Because what's going on in the psyche is that we are a portal. Remember, we're a portal through which through which life wants to wants to show itself. And uh, if I'm busy thinking all the time, I can't get down to what, what's in the body. Um, we can find what it is that we cling to. The Tibetans have a saying that says, uh, we have two enemies in life, clinging and aversion. <laughs> you know, we want to cling on to what we know, we want to get dependent on what we know. And 
What is true for us human beings is we get out of the brain, out of the mind. We get into this vast, vast source of the soul, where the feelings are, where the intuition is, the great wisdom of the body. The body has been around a whole lot longer than the mind. And the body is much more able to handle these relational things than the mind is. And we need the mind. I'm not against the mind at all. But we need to, we need to understand that, that the body has more wisdom. So, years ago, years ago, what was that? I don't know what. I read, I read a book called let your, let your Body, let your body uh, Interpret Your Dream. Set me free. Go to the image. Do the image get the thing? And ask what's in the image rather than ask the mind what it thinks. Just to go in and ask and ask the body. Uh, you know that you know that you're, you or someone else is, is in is lost when they uh, uh, belief claims faith. Let's go. <coughs> belief claims, but, but faith. Let's go. The uh, for, for me the, uh, the, the the dream that started off for me was was uh, in, in the dream, uh, my brother came to me and said, uh, the movement from unbelief to belief is difficult. But the movement from belief to faith is 10,000 times more difficult. To, to move to that place where I, I think we all must find a way to move there, is to, how can I get to this place that I rest in something other than my thoughts? Rest in my in what the soul wants me to bring into the world. To rest, to rest in places where where I don't have to worry about what you think about my belief or not. It's, it's to simply have let go. Of, uh, Carl Jung said in one of my favorite quotes of our our wall at home says, um, one of the high one of the highest and best experiences of all, is to be alone with yourself when all else falls away. Only this can give you a true foundation. The highest and best experience of all is to be alone with yourself, to find out what it is that can support you when all else falls away. Only this can bring you an indestructible foundation. As, as a death psychologist, I love it when people came in and said to me, I'm really, really depressed. Yay! Because I knew if, if they were depressed, that the soul, the soul saying, I'm tired of being, of being depressed. I'm going to pull back all my energy. I'm going to come back here and then I'm going to deal with what the soul asked me to bring into the world. We don't want fear to go away. How am I going to hit that? No. We don't want fear to go away, even though belief is a cover of fear. But, but we, want, we want fear to lead us to what it is, to the wisdom of the body. And you can only do that if you're willing to go into the body and feel what the body is doing. You don't go up here and say, what are you thinking? Go down to the body and ask the body what it feels like. And this uh, capacity, this capacity to to relate to fear, is probably the most important important thing that I could say to us here is, is that if I can come in, uh, come into a relationship to my fear, and I can make that the basis of how I relate to you, rather than on how we of the same tribe. I mean, let's let's admit it: tribal bitching is fun. <laughs> Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, is there a part of you that, that loves getting together with people and, and talking about how bad it is? <laughs> okay. I'm going to, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, open it up for questions. However, I have I have an annoyance with open circle people sometimes that don't ask questions of the speaker. They want to give their opinion. I'm not interested in your opinion about what you believe. That. 
But, but, in, in presenting a topic that is so big in my psyche, I haven't chewed on this for 45 years. It, it was really important to me, it was really important to me that, you know, have your questions appear about what I'm trying to say. Because I realize I, I've, said, I've said more than I could say. <laughs> okay, uh, are, there, are there questions that I said? Oh, okay. Okay, these, these two people have their. Okay, we've got several questions there. David, do you uh, believe that a belief and an opinion are the same, or how do you differentiate? Uh, you know, belief, belief and opinion are the same. Is the same. I, I, I've gone to the world, I've used these, I've found these facts, and based on what my, my grid is, you know, I, I, I might stand up for those. I think it's okay to have an opinion, okay to have a belief, I mean, we have a belief, but I'm more interested in, in what, in what I, um, in, in what I don't believe, I'm more interested in what's coming new, I mean, I can always find something in the church to blame for my ministry, right, that doesn't mean any good, so, so uh, yeah, they're, they're the same, okay, back here. You just now were talking about the uh, difference or distinction between belief and opinion. My question is, how would you distinguish between a belief and faith? Uh, belief, belief claims. It is this way. It is this way. Faith is experienced in the body as a relaxation into the, the what isness of the moment. The, the um, often, often in our in our life, we we uh, all we have to do when we're caught there is to drop into the what isness of this moment. So when we do meditations or centering here, what we do is we have to come in and be into the what isness of this garden. And you notice if you do that faithfully, you, you, something happens down in the soul when you sit and relax and you come into the what is, is of the moment. If you go into if you go into a belief, peace goes away. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, David. I'm very, very touched. And um, the thing about the fear, okay, I'm with you on that. And for years, I've been trying to go into the fear and the depression and feel in my body. And there's so much resistance to being able to be in that space. So could you talk to that a little? Yeah, okay. We basically are lazy people. Most of us do not want to do the hard work of raising consciousness. It's really hard work. There's hours and hours, hours and hours and hours of me sleeping on the floor, wailing at the spirit for not giving me the answers to the questions that they brought up. I, I suffered for years, for 10 years I, I, I suffered, because we don't want to do the, the, hard, the hard work. And so the task is always to come back to the spirit. You're not, the fear isn't going to kill you. Your anxiety might, but not your fear. I was curious, um, when you're making the comment of back and forth between the body and then talking about the soul, if those were the same item. So I'm relating specifically to your comment about the, yeah. the body has been around longer than the brain. Uh, if that was related to the soul again, and if you could expand on that. Good, good, good question. Um, I'll, let me say it this way: I have a better, I have a better chance of accessing my, accessing my um, depth when I go into the body. I, I have learned how to get there through the mind, but if, if, if it, it means dropping your mind down through the body, and in the body I have more access to the, to the soul. I also have access to the soul when I find out what it is that I'm pissed off about. If I find something that's really, really irritating me, that's that's it's in the body. I go into the body. What is this issue all about? And I can I can find it there. So I would just say that the soul is access more accessible, in my experience, through the through the body than through the mind. Does that help? Okay. And the, the, your point about the, the body being around longer than the mind? So the, the animal instinct to take the fight or flight instinct has been around a long time. 
And what we have now in our culture is, is a fight or flight is active that I've ever seen it before. Okay. But it takes, because the brain is a later addition, or mind's later addition to that amygdala, I have to really, really, really work to calm that, to calm that thing down. And going up with views and the fundamentals, I've had to do a lot of work so I can my, my amygdala is pretty fired up just, just to be able. Okay. David? Okay. Um, you said something in the talk about belief claims. I mean, it, it's really noticeable in some cases in history and even today that people, in the face of incontrovertible evidence that what they believe is, is wrong, like I've heard people who talk from the Flat Earth Society and so on, or to make a less comical example, there are people who belong to a certain cult and it turns out that the cult leader is so, yes, um, crazy. Uh, crazy or uh, sexually uh, using all his members for his own purpose, or things like that. They can't change, they can't drop the belief. If they've invested so much time and emotional energy in it that no fact can change it. Right, and what, but what, that, what does change it though it, is if someone, if someone can make that fear feel like a with, with their heart. The field, the heart field, will eventually calm that, calm that anger. That anger. You're right. People don't, don't change. But what, what dissolves it, and that's what I hope that we can do, is that the more I can live from my center, that soft animal of the body, and I can relate to you when, when from that part. I'm not going to, I'm not going to aggravate your anger. But if, if I meet your anger with my anger, we go to war. So, so I, uh, yeah. Yeah, question. We have a question from the gazebo. Oh, okay. Uh, I agree with your idea that uh, beliefs and opinions are equal, okay? On the one hand, you have beliefs and, and opinions, but on the other hand, you have knowledge. So I would like your idea of what the definition of knowledge is and how a person attains that, as opposed to belief and opinion. Yeah. If you think of the word knowledge, is, let me ask you, what do you know? You know, ask the question, what, no, 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 don't answer, don't answer. <laughs> because you know more than I do. But, <laughs> but um, so, we are caught in this culture where we're confusing information with intelligence. Okay? If we go to what it is, what it is I really know, there's not much I really know. I, according to the quantum physics, this, this material world isn't even real. But I experience it as real. But what, what do I know about the structure of the unconscious? I have some ideas, I have some experiences, but I, uh, I, uh, I'm not sure I'm hitting your question. But. Say this, but, but I think that knowledge comes from direct experience. For instance, uh, some women here can, they have a direct knowledge and experience of, of the pain that comes with childbirth. You and I can only have opinions. Right. I'm, I'm glad I'm not one of them, by the way. <laughs> okay, Barbara. Thank you. Um, David, I heard you say that all beliefs come from fears. You shared that belief, right? Um, that stopped me right dead in my tracks. Um, because I want to believe that we can have beliefs that come from love. I have beliefs that come from love and not from fear. So do you want us to believe that all our beliefs come from fear? Exclusively? Um, let me respond to that. What's showing up, what's showing up in my psyche for how how fear how fear is at the bottom of so much of what we're going going through right now. And I and that's kinda of why I'm bringing this I've been chewing on this topic for a long time. But I'm bringing it because it seems to me to be really critical for some of us to drop through drop through that down to the fear, to talk about the fear rather than personalities that are that we're, we're working against. Um, or, so I, what I'm having to do in private conversations is actually what, what beliefs come from love. So if you said, God is love, 
Who knows that? I've always bought them when I God as love. That's an idea. And it might be an, an idea that you're supposed to bring. Let me make that point clear because I didn't say it. The, the way I understand my life and your life is that all of us are a portal to, to stuff to manifest from the unconscious into the, into the conscious. So if you particularly have, have a, I want to show to the world, I want to show to the world what love can do. I don't have that. I don't even have any, anything that that's something I want to do. I don't understand that. But you do. I know you, you personally, and I do. Because I've been given something else to articulate that's not got the idea around love. But if, if the soft animal of the body says, I really, I really want to talk about love in the world, what it can do, then that's what you must do. But, but to say that's what I must do, or what the world must do, is no, you find your, what your body channel says, and I'll find what mine says. Because then we, we all, it's like, I used to have this crystal thing in my, in my office that had many facets of pieces of water, water for crystal, you know. And I'm saying to people, this, this reflection right here, this facet here, is only one facet of the hundred that are on this, on this crystal ball. So this, when you get today, it's my reflection of what I've been given. And we get, we get to hear yours. So when I say all, all, belief, all belief goes to, uh, um, goes to fear, <laughs> Cats here, can you get, get an alliance in the day? It's 11.30, 11, 11 you got it. We got, we got people with much more intelligence. Uh, so, but Barbara, what I would have you do though, is I would, when you say, I believe love, I want you to say, what don't you believe about love? Where is the doubt in heaven? That's where your growth will be. Your growth won't be in. Growth won't be in, in, in doing your love, and your growth will be where don't I believe love? love and that's sort of the invitation I'm saying this morning. When I say I believe, so I would say I believe the dream leads people on. And, and I, the other side of that is I don't know, let people follow their dreams and end up shooting people. You know, so you have to really be careful with, with, with that. Okay. Question. Yeah. Well, okay.